Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Randy, as Meredith said, and I am a proud IB B Ed graduate. Um, this year, I am working in North Van and West Van, so it's exciting. There's jobs out there for you, and um, it's great being in the workforce and getting paid for practicum. It's fantastic, so you have that to look forward to. Thank you for having me today. Um, to start off, I'm just going to ask you a question to think about for a second. And actually, it's two questions. So first, I want you to think about your inquiry project. And I know you've probably thought a lot about it, particularly for this class, so you might not want to, but just think about it. And also think about your rationale for teaching. And just think of those two things and put them together. So I can give you about 20 seconds. I was in grade one and two this morning, so they need the one minute when you probably only need 20 seconds. Okay, now I want you to think about how those two concepts relate, your inquiry project and your rationale for teaching. Okay, and so the reason I brought this up is because for me, my inquiry project was the result of my rationale for teaching. So I at first was kind of stuck, like, wait, an inquiry? I'm a new teacher. What can I possibly ask myself? I don't know anything at all um, yet about teaching, so what could I ask? But I brought it back to why I was teaching, and I'm not sure if you've done this activity yet, but it was one of my favorites last year where we had to um, kind of split into different groups according to our rationale for teaching. Have you done that? No. So um, this was great for me because I realized I'm teaching for, with my heart. That's why I decided to teach, and it kind of led me through the entire BEAD program. So that's why I brought this up, is because my inquiry project came from my rationale for teaching. And I found that my inquiry project became so much easier um, when I thought of my rationale for teaching. So that's my first idea for you today, is to go back to why you're teaching. Why did you enroll in the BEAD program? Why are you spending so much money this year and you, using all your time to become a teacher? What is the passion that's driving you as a teacher? And that will help you. That helped me so much with my inquiry project. So for today, um, what I have planned is There we go. Oh, there we go, <laughs> today. Um, so first of all, starting with passion for your project. The second thing I'm going to talk about is research. How I actually was able to take all that information you have in your proposal, that information you probably started to gather and put that into something tangible. And then constructing the project, which came from the research. And then answering the why, which is probably you're all spending all this time on your inquiry project. Last year, when I was where you are, I thought, oh my gosh, I have so many unit plans, so many lesson plans, 10-week practicum coming up. Oh my gosh. And I kind of considered my inquiry project to be like a master's thesis or something. So I was taking it really seriously and thinking, why am I doing this? This is so much work. There is a great answer for that. So proposal to project. So relate your research and your ideas to your rationale. So whenever you're kind of feeling lost, it really brought me back to why I was teaching. So for me, that was teaching with the heart. When I first put forward my proposal, it was really specific. And it w related to why I wanted to teach, but it was just really specific. So for me, if I brought it back to that general idea, it took me to something more broad. So maybe mine was teaching with the heart, and I did a project on caring classrooms. Those two things kind of go hand in hand. I was lucky. But maybe you decided to teach because you want to change the world. I think that that's quite common. And maybe you're doing your project on outdoor schools. There's still a relation between those two things. So what brought you into this classroom and what you do on your inquiry project can be connected. That was huge for me. The second point I want to bring up with your proposal to your project is, is it too broad or too particular? I don't know if you're at the point yet where you've narrowed down your question specifically, um, but this is, I mean, if your topic is really broad, Meredith, and your other advisor will probably guide you in the direction like, this is too much. You have to narrow it down. But that being said, just look to something that you can point out in a classroom if it's too broad. If it's too particular, look to that bigger picture, why you're here, why you want to be a teacher. It really helped me through. Talk to your advisors as well. You have incredible resources here. 
as much as we like to think, um, well, we are, I mean, we're very qualified people um, coming into the BEAD program, but we're only new to classroom. So even if you have volunteer experience or past career, your advisors have experience as a teacher and they'll be able to really help you point down how your proposal can become an actual inquiry. For me, I started out not asking a question. Um, really, I just had this idea of something I want to study, but to turn it into a question, your advisors can be there and they're fantastic. You have such good resources here. And your educator niche. Um, this is really cool because Every single person who um, graduates a Bachelor of Education program or does PDP at um, SFU or does something at UVic, they will all be doing um, practicum. But not everybody is going to be studying what you're studying in your inquiry project. So that's huge. When you're doing this, if you find something you like, you can um, you completely have a niche. And when you go um, out into the market as an educator, you'll be able to talk about something so much more than someone else. So really develop your niche for what it is. It's really this entire idea of the proposal and the project, this first slide, what I'm trying to get across for, to you is find what your passion is, and I know that's really hard um, right now because you have so much going on, it's hard to pinpoint what that is, but once you do and bring it back to why you're a teacher, that, I mean, that's huge. You really can start to do so much more work and it becomes so much more interesting. So the second thing um, I'm gonna talk about is research. So I have here read, 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 and um, I did a very, um, I was in arts for undergrad, so it was very reading heavy, but I know not everybody likes reading as much as I do. In the PED program, I found it wasn't as much reading, but if you can, for this project, read. Um, last year, we weren't allowed to do formal research, and this year, you're not allowed to either. So I know that's a huge question. How do I actually get Re, um, how do I get evidence for my project without being able to do research when I'm in schools? It seems almost counterintuitive. Reading was huge for me. Um, have you had the UBC Library come in yet to talk about yet? Yeah. So using the search engine, coming from someone who did their undergrad here, it was kind of, it, I understood it. If you find it complicated, go and talk to the librarian because this is a great resource for you. I found so many articles, especially when you need scholarly articles, through the UBC Library search engine. Google Scholar, if you don't feel comfortable using UBC Library, try Google Scholar because they will also have a lot of scholarly articles. And a big hint I have here is to use different words. Um, instead of always using the same, like I would put maybe caring, um, in quotation marks, and then classrooms, change those up because you will get the same articles. A sa another thing I have to recommend with this is once you find one author, keep going with that author because they'll lead you in the direction of other authors about that topic. So for me, there was some authors I found that led me to so many different things and I'm still looking them up now because it's great for what I'm doing. So go from that and also look at their references because who they're referencing will be relevant to what you're studying as well. Um, and then there's Google Scholar Books, UBC Library, um, you can get some books. I never really used books for my inquiry project, but I think some people did, and it's a good option. You could order them from Amazon, but that is timely. I would definitely recommend, if you're reading, scholarly articles over books, but you, again, you have your advisors. There's a lot of great local authors on educational scholarship, um, or educational resources, and they can, your advisors would be likely to maybe know more about where you can get those resources and your class textbook. So even for me, I did caring classrooms for my project, and I could find things in my science textbook. I know you have Patrick as a uh, science teacher, so we had him too, he was fantastic, a really hands-on class, loved that. And with that class textbook, I could still find things that are relevant to my project. So look through and just find that, like, yes, I can use this. As well, we're working with the general public, so I know coming from undergrad, it was weird for me. I'm like, I can look at a blog and cite this. But for this project, I think you're still allowed to do that this year. You can actually cite a blog, and you can look at newspaper articles, editorials, or comments. Because we're working with the general public, that's so important. You might be educated as a teacher and have a huge background in child psychology, but you could have a parent approach you, and their opinion really matters about what they think of their child. So when you look through things like comments or editorials, you can kind of get an idea of what people think of a certain subject. So while that's not your research, you can still kind of get different ideas and cite that later. Like, this person didn't agree with this, or this is a negative side effect. And other thing, websites. So 
If you're focusing on a topic, there probably or may be a website dedicated to something similar to that. Those are great things to look at um, because oftentimes they're trying to sell something to a school and they'll like different programs and you can find a lot of information about that program on their website. It's great. If you don't like reading, uh, I tried to get an, I know we're doing audio visual or yeah, audio visual and kinesthetic learners. So I tried to bring that in. Um, you can look at podcasts. I found these after I graduated UBC BED and they're fantastic. I missed school. So I listened to these when I'm bored and they are really great though. You can find lectures from Oxford, um, Berkeley. So fantastic schools offering you information about very particular things. I don't know if you've heard about the question formulation technique yet, and you'll probably maybe have a guest speaker on that. It's fantastic, and you can find a podcast about the question formulation technique. So you can find very particular podcasts, and I'm sure you can cite those as well. TED Talks are great. Um, there's lots of TED Talks on education. And MOOCs, which are massive online, um, massive online course, they're massive online courses. I can't remember exactly what that stands for. but. If I know you're probably like, I don't need another class. Why would I take this? There might be a class that's made exactly on the subject you're studying for inquiry project. Look it up. Um, I've listed four different sites here, and I can forward Meredith this PowerPoint, just so that you, you know, that's an option. If you feel like listening to, this is great actually, because when you, I was in the BEd program, I didn't have time for anything, and I know some people in this class just were exercising at lunch. That's incredible, but I didn't do that, and I was like, how can I run? and do my homework at the same time. And this is great because you can upload things like a podcast onto your iPod or your MP3 player, go for a run and listen to them or do the dishes or have a bath or whatever. So you can mix in school when you really can't take a break, you can mix in school and kind of have a break at the same time. And experts, again, websites, um, you've got Meredith, you've got, you know, you have so many amazing advisors and I'm so sorry, I forgot. I'm sorry, you have Shanaz and Meredith here. And they're, you know, they're a wealth of knowledge for you, um, but also you can look for other experts online. And the last thing I recommend for research is talking and testing. And what I mean about this is talking all the time about the research you're doing. My mom, my boyfriend, like my friends, they're all very familiar with my inquiry project. And maybe I'm very passionate about it, but also I think it's that I talked a lot about it. And the more you talk about something, the, the more real your research becomes. So right now you might be doing research and kind of like putting it aside and not thinking about it. If you talk about it, you're getting that time and you're becoming more of an expert. So when it comes time to present in front of your class and to do your actual presentation, you're ready. And it also will help you kind of narrow down the information that you have. What I mean by test is this is the kinesthetic element. So even though you can't use um, from the research, you can't, you can't test yourself and put it into your research. I don't think that would count because that would kind of be like doing um, a master's work. But you can still test different things that you read about and see like, you know what, this isn't going to work or this is going to work. And you don't have to test it with your students. You could test it at home and it will just give you a general idea of what your, whether your research is actually taking the right direction. Even though you can't use that, it might help you narrow things down. Okay, so the actual project, um, it was really hard for me. I gathered so much research and I had no idea how I was going to put this into an actual project. So what I did was an elevator speech. Um, if it can fit into your elevator speech, it can fit into your project. I know UBC has solder, um, a business school, but we all have to learn to sell education and we specifically need to learn how to sell the project that we're doing. And so an elevator speech is 30 seconds to two minutes selling what you're going to do. I put a few different YouTube clips here, and again, I'll forward this to Meredith, um, but we could practice elevator speeches, but you will have that opportunity, and we could watch them. You will also probably have an opportunity to do that. If you can't fit, like just when you get all your research together, try to come up with an elevator speech to talk about what you're doing your project on. And if you can't, what you fit into that 30 seconds is what should probably be on your poster with more detail. So you'll find those five key points that you don't want to leave out. And again, this is where talking about your project all the time becomes very important. You see what people react to and it's just, it's great. So 
And elevator speech was really like this guiding thing. Last year we had a surprise elevator speech when we presented and that was kind of stressful. But at the same time it was good because it showed me like this is what I really cared about and it was what was on my board. You'll become so familiar with your inquiry subject that doing 30 seconds about it will be nothing. Um, so if it can fit on there, put it on your poster. And what I recommend is write, cut, write, cut. This might seem, again, counterintuitive, but it was very necessary for me because I had so much information. So those subjects that you have, the abstract, the newfound understandings, I don't know if yours are similar, ours were along those lines. I would write as much as you can for those, and this is what I did at least, I cut a lot of that until it was the length it had to be. And you're, you're writing down a lot then, and it seems like, wait, why would I do all that work just to delete it into cyberspace? It's actually not like that, because you, you're seeing how much you repeat. And it was so necessary for me to do that. And I definitely recommend doing that. That way you see what information is most important. From that, I brought mine down into smaller abstracts, smaller newfound understandings, smaller approach, and came up with a successful project. Again, talk about your project. Um, as much as you can. I can't state that enough because the more you talk about it, the more it'll become clear what you're doing. And maybe you'll be talking to, like I was talking to my mom once and she said something, it led me to something else. Those type of things happen and it's great because you, sometimes people you know, know you really well and might say that thing that's like, oh my gosh, yeah, right, light bulb, I can do that. And include tools with your project. A lot of people last year had cutouts that they would bring. Um, I didn't do that and I think it's a good idea but I also think we have technology now and we could probably be friendlier to the environment by emailing resources. But I also think that um, some great tools that I saw last year were picture books. Um, if you're working in primary, even if you're working in intermediate, this is huge to include picture books um, because you can read something. So if you're doing a project on, I don't know, even, I'm trying to think of some from last year, like grade sevens preparing for grade eight or something. There still might be, maybe not a storybook, but a novel that you could bring that, say, that would say like, look, this is a great thing to have in your classroom. And other teachers can take pictures of those things on their iPhones. We probably, most of us have camera phones, and we can access those later. So if you're going to bring resources, I would recommend actual tools that can be used in the classroom. And the last thing I want to talk about is what is this all for? Um, for me, as a teacher, um, I'm a TSC now in two districts. And it's not always an easy job, to be honest. It's a great job. I love my job. But we de I definitely have those days, and I think most people do, in any job where you go home and you're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? And as a TSC, sometimes that can happen. You walk into a new classroom, and there's just so much going on. I think the worst day I had as a TSC actually was a one-hour block. I was there after lunch, and it was early dismissal, and I was just like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? But after those days, it's like, why am I here? You ask, you ask yourself that. And last night, I was looking through my inquiry proposal, and I was reading it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, right, this is why I'm a teacher. And my inquiry project, I mean, most people would say, oh, my inquiry project was like, you know, didn't, I don't know. But for me, it was guidance. The, my inquiry project, when I go home, and what I did in that project reminds me, yes, this is why I'm a teacher. And it's very, very important for me to have that and I think it is for most people to have a constant reminder that yes, I'm doing this for a reason. I strongly believe in this subject. Interviews. Um, I think I talk about my inquiry project for every, well, for every time I talk about practicum, I talk about my inquiry project once. Or no, sorry, for every two times I talk about my practicum, I talk about my inquiry project once. And that seems like a lot. I think maybe some people wouldn't say that they talk about it that much. I'm really passionate about my inquiry subject. But I do talk about it a lot. And like I said before, every student who graduates from a PDP or a B.Ed. or who's interviewing for a teacher position or a TOC position has completed practicum. And it's great. Practicum is amazing. It will pr provide you with such practical knowledge. But nobody else is studying um, what you've studied, probably. I mean, somebody else might be studying, but that specific Thing, and the amount of time you've put into it, the resources you come away with are incredible. You have that educator niche and it's, I think it's probably quite impressive. What I'm getting from when people talk to me about my inquiry project is that they're impressed that I know so much about a specific subject. And so last year when I was in your place, I kept on thinking to myself, like, I don't really know what this is for. Like, I'm doing this project, it's so important. 
I am very passionate about my inquiry project. It will guide me in so many different ways and it impresses people. So when I interviewed for one of the districts I met, they asked me about my inquiry project multiple times in my interview. And they asked me questions about how I make my inquiry project come alive. Um, so that was really important. And another, the other interview I had, I brought it up. And again, you can, I mean, you, I have two jobs now, so I think it went well for me that I brought it up. But you can kind of tell that the interviewer is like, yes, yes, keep talking about this. So I, I can't state enough that when you go into an interview, which hopefully you all will, um, you should bring this up and you should know as much as you can and put a lot of work into your project because your advisors will notice that and they will be providing you with references. So that's great. And the future, um, for me, I, I love teaching. I'm not sure like, oh, is this my forever thing? I love it so much right now and I'm very passionate about education, but I don't know if I want to teach forever. Um, for me, my inquiry project is telling me like when I do a master's, it has to be related to this. So I'll go to you know a different province, a different country, if I can study what I did for my inquiry project for a master's degree. So I can't state enough how important your inquiry project is. Um, what I can really say again, I'll just kind of reiterate what I said today. You know, find your passion if you've you've already chosen a subject. So identify what your passion is in that subject. The second thing I can recommend is do your research using the resources you have. It might seem frustrating that you can't do actual research in your classrooms. Looking back, I don't think that any research I would have done during my practicum would have been that great for my project anyways, because you're learning how to be a teacher at this point still. So you're still getting all those skills. And I think that you can take away a lot from your classroom. It doesn't have to be research for this. So just put that aside. Take the resources you have. A lot of articles, which are great. When you start reading about something you love, it's easy. I mean, I'm still always reading about my inquiry subject because I love it. And the third thing is putting it all together. You know, just write, cut, and talk. Work out what, how you can put it all into those small um, subjects for your poster. And really, just the final thing I can state is this is very important. Your inquiry project right now, in the midst of lesson plans and unit plans and learning guitar, I don't know if you're doing that yet, <laughs> it might seem a bit difficult, but it's actually very important. And I think if you have one school subject that you talk about half as much as you talk about your practicum, that just is an idea of how important it is. So I'm done really quickly, but I talk really fast, so I'm really sorry if anybody couldn't understand me. But um, yeah, I'm here for your questions, which is oh, great. Wow, because build up with a caring classroom, right? So yes. have you been able to like, use any of your inquiry proposal ideas in, in what, while you're TOC? Great question. Um, actually, that could seem difficult, but I've been quite lucky because every day you go into a classroom, you have an opportunity to make a caring classroom. I can imagine for other people it would be more challenging for your inquiry topic, but there's little things you can bring in throughout the day. And so for me, I always start my day off with just a really warm welcome, trying to be at the door when the kids get there, going ahead of time to look through the lesson plan. And everything that's on, or the day plan, everything that's on the day plan, you can put a bit of yourself into that. So how you deliver the lesson depends on you. The teacher will leave you ideas of how to, of what you're doing. Um, but that thing, I know right now you're doing your lesson plans for your advisors and they're saying, you know, opening and this, um, like, you know, main points. And those are very important. They'll set you up for success when you become a TOC, if you choose to do so. And you don't have that all laid out for you because you know how to execute a lesson properly. And when you're doing that, think of your inquiry project or, you know, whatever your passion is for teaching and bringing it in at that point. So I'm lucky a caring classroom can be brought in every single day. But really, I guess what, what you're asking, it would take a long time to really develop the entire thing for what I had in my project. I'm trying to think of something that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, relationships with students is huge. And so how, even how you deal, deal with things like classroom management. Um, I always go back to a caring classroom and I think to myself, I'm not doing classroom management, I'm just setting the classroom environment up. And as a teacher, it's how you respond to the students, you know, whether you're smiling when they come in, how you laugh when they're joking, those small things. So I can bring it in every day. Any other questions? Yeah, Maddie. My inquiry project 
definitely has an element to ID in it. So yeah. if you were interviewing, not necessarily with an ID school or a district that maybe didn't have many ID schools, is mm -hmm. that still a, like an asset, or would you try to tone that down because? No, I would no. never try to tone down ID. Um, <laughs> 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 if you are in the right cohort. Um, but I, yeah, it's, I would never try to tone it down because some teachers will say like, oh, ID, that's a lot of terminology or something. You might get that feedback. Whatever, you know how great it is, you're here. Mm -hmm. And people who are, I mean, a lot of administrators also know how great ID is. And our curriculum, you probably have heard this a million times, is becoming so much more inquiry-based. And the, I think they call them the big ideas in the British Columbia curriculum right now. Yeah, the big ideas are so similar to these kind of ID. Yeah, exactly the concept. So if you've done a project on ID, totally bring that in. They'll appreciate the inquiry aspect. They'll appreciate, you know, the more holistic learning. It's great. Good luck. Yeah. Um, so this is about your project. Um, yeah. So what would you say would be one of the most important um, factors when you, um, in terms of having a caring classroom? Oh, for a caring classroom, what would be the most important thing? Really, it's the relationships you have. Um, there was four things that really contributed to a caring classroom last year when I did it. It was relationships with your students, um, always never leaving problems, setting a bus. I know these, I look at them and I use them every day, but it's, I, I can't believe I'm stumbling right now. So it's a positive environment, ca um, caring relationships, never leaving problems unanswered, and oh goodness, I can't believe I can't think of this last one. Well, I do, the biggest thing is setting relationships. And if I was to take away one thing from a caring classroom that I can tell you all today, it would be to make those relationships. So you've been in your practicum classes since September, or I guess probably October, one Thursday a week in your two weeks. Keep up those relationships with your students. When you go into your 10 weeks, they might change because at least for me, I took on more of a teacher role during that time. Um, but just, you know, stay positive. Get to know what they're interested in. Like, do they like playing soccer? Meredith, I'm sure, stated this, because she stated this a lot for us, but really get to know your students. And not just know your students, know your advisor, know the administration in your school if you can, and get to know the parents, because all four of those people really make up the caring classroom. Um, and if you have EAs in your class, that's great. The custodian, everybody in the school, just set that up. Oh, and that's the last thing, modeling caring relationships was the important, or modeling caring, yeah, caring relationships in a caring classroom. But I would say definitely relationships is the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. There was this great example, just one off your question, Alice, about the relationship piece. And because that was such a focus for Randy and that transition from 321 into 418, when you're going from that once a week teacher to now an everyday teacher, and things started, things generally do heat up because the testing time is over and they realize, oh, she or he is here all the time, right? I can't pull the wool over their eyes. <laughs> so Randy had a PE class and he was on observation number two. <laughs> and it was one of those, right? But the best part of that lesson was, and we'll both never forget it, was that after that, she went back and she held a class meeting. And she explained, here's what happened, here's what shouldn't have happened, why did it happen, and here's what they can do to turn it around. Following into never leave a problem unaddressed. Right? And boy, was that the tipping point. They realized then that not only did she care about them, she cared about classroom management, she cared about their safety, because they were crazy that day, but it was that relationship piece. She put herself out there as a human, this isn't okay, here's why, and then talked about how they could improve, and then that was really the switch, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And then yeah, it, was it was unbelievable, the difference. Um, and I really use my inquiry project in that instance. And yeah. I do that class meeting thing a lot when I'm TOCing, because you come in and kids think they can take advantage of a TOC. I thought that when I was a kid too. And if you set that class meeting, say, look, I'm upset right now. And by changing it to like, I'm upset instead of I'm mad, it gives the kids like, oh, look, we can develop empathy for this person. Mm -hmm. She's upset, we know what that's like. And you know, just giving them that time to think instead of always blaming or yelling, that's huge. Um, and actually, I thought after doing that meeting, like, these kids just probably don't like me. I kind of got a bit upset. <laughs> and, but I got proof they still liked me and my caring relationships shown. I went back to my practicum school one day to TOC, and it was so nice to see all the kids, and they all ran up hugging me. So I'm, it was really nice because I know I set that caring classroom up, and they, yeah, we had a great time together.
Yeah, and I saw another hand. Oh, yeah. Um, do you have any tips to effectively classroom manage as a TLC? Yes, definitely. Set your expectations. Because she's with media and affordable. Oh, really? yeah. oh, she's so great. That's great. Um, but I was with Jane in grade three last year. So if you ever see the grade fours, some of them were mine. And um, your question was, how can I cut your management during TOC? Set the expectations as soon as you get there. I, the first few times I TOC'd, I didn't do this because I was so worried about getting the attendance into the office and like the secretary's going to see. I didn't send it down. The principal's going to see it or something. I don't know. Set those expectations. As soon as they get in the room, say you're excited to be there. Um, and just state, like, I, something I say all the time is if your parents or your teacher walked into the classroom right now, would they be happy about how you're acting? And that kind of, you know, makes them think, like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. Or listen to the little voice in your head. Those are two things I use a lot. But um, if there's problems throughout the day, but early on in the day, I just say, like, look, we're going to have a really fun day. These are the activities I have planned. Or if you want it to be fun, though, you, you know, we have to be behaving in a certain way. It's hard. IB classrooms can be loud. And so it's, sometimes I feel pressure as a TOC to keep a classroom quiet because if someone walks by, you don't know what the standard for that school is. So just kind of try to pick up on what the school is and maintain your com like make sure you're comfortable in that classroom each day. But expectations early, key. Liz, do you have a question? Or do you need to ask her? Well, it was kind of on the same line. It was just um, how you modify a class meeting for, like, and do you DOC up grade seven to K? Yeah. So how you modify your class meeting sort of grade five, six, seven. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if there was a situation and you're starting to still establish your relationships. Are you in grade six, seven? For five, no, six, I just sort of oh. fascinated with how you would, because if we're TOC, yeah. we, we won't have a choice. If we, we, we are sort of looking at grade two, but with that we get thrown into a grade six, seven. And then that whole sort of attitude, how do you? Yeah. Actually, that? Um, I'm happy you brought that up. I, TOC, or I did my practicum in a grade three classroom at West Bay Elementary. Fantastic experience. I thought I wanted to teach primary. I've started TOC. I don't want to teach primary now. I really want to teach intermediate. And grade six, seven, five, six, seven actually respond so well to the class meeting thing. And they actually respond so well to most classroom management attempts that you do. Maybe I've just been really lucky with the classrooms I've stepped into. But when I go to a class, if I've had to TOC and do a classroom meeting thing, it's normally, like, the kids respond well. It doesn't even usually have to get to that point. If it is, it's just kind of more of an open forum. The kids, there's a certain point where I think they become uncomfortable with each other. I don't think I've been in a grade 7 class yet where they're at that point. They're, they're just really open with one another, and so it's been really good for me so far to modify it. I would say read your audience that you're working with that day. The classroom meeting wouldn't maybe work for all groups. And just to modify it, maybe set some ground rules for them that would make sense. But I found it really works well for older grades. Yeah. Okay. I have a question with regards to the IB program in Interviews. Yeah. Were you ever yeah. asked anything? Yeah. Oh, with Heidi and Candace. Oh, yeah. oh, they took another. Wow, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Um, so my question is with regards to IB and interviews. So if, were you ever asked questions about how, since you've done the IB program, if you were placed at a school that wasn't IB, how you would adapt to that? Yeah, I can't, um, I don't know if I was asked that question specifically, but very close to that. And people will ask that. I, I'm in North Bend, I'm hired as an IB TOC, but I've probably only been in the IB schools there six times. And I think I met one of you there. Yes, there you are. Yes. Oh, Sarah, yeah. yes, that was like Capilano. Great. Yeah, yeah, Capilano. So um, I've been in those classrooms a few times, but you get called out for everything. And when a school district hires you, I imagine they know that they're hiring you to be a general TOC. So I did get asked something about that, but because IB is so based on themes and so similar to the BC curriculum, that's just how I answered. Um, and that there's nothing ever wrong with teaching inquiry. Right now, people are really excited about inquiry teaching. And so just bring in an inquiry, bring in those things that don't have to do with IB terminology but can be applied to a wide range of subjects. And, and that worked for me. That's my connection with Yeah, any more questions? Yeah. Um, so this is just going back to your inquiry project. Uh, this year we potentially have the opportunity to present our inquiry project in something beyond a poster. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, in thinking about other alternative means to presenting and compiling your project, would you, did you enjoy the poster portion of that? Did you think it was helpful as a person reading everybody else's projects? Mm-hmm. Um, or do you think that there could have been a different medium that would work better? Or did you have any? What I really liked about the project as opposed to paper is that the project allowed you to share with other people and I was nervous to do that, especially coming from an arts degree. I just don't want to hand in my paper and have it marked. I don't even want to like know what the, I, it made me uncomfortable to be in a classroom with one teacher, but she's amazing, so it's not that bad, but like, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to know my professor and they're going to mark my paper. Ah, what if I really do terrible? So the project was great because it tested me. It was like, you have to present this with other people. That's important when you're a teacher, you start to share so many things and knowledge is one of those things you'll be sharing. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate it for that aspect. When I was reading them that day, um, I was reading them, but I didn't, people have a lot of information on them, so you don't get to see those, you don't get to see everything they've written. I would really make bold things stand out, that your main points, I would try to make those stand out. That would make the project I mean, really purposeful for everybody involved. Mm-hmm. When you're presenting, or what, however you choose to present, I can't understate the importance of that um, elevator speech, and we were talking about that before, because when it comes to an interview, or it comes to being in a school, or even if it comes to acquiring your knowledge that you have, that's going to be so important, because it's that condensed information that you actually need. It's not you know, all those other things. When, I think when I came away, at least from undergrad, I came away with these general ideas, and that's kind of an inquiry project, you'll come away with general ideas. So however you choose to present, just choose that key information and present it that way. I'm, I, I would be very interested in seeing how other people choose to present. I, I think last year we kind of talked about maybe presenting in other ways, and then the, pa- uh, the poster came out. But if you can be innovative and come up with something else, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Just a couple more minutes, any other questions? Yeah. Anything? Um, what do you say about the like the whole citing and the how you, you yeah. talk to people to get information and how we can't do direct quotes? But anything about that whole ethics piece? Did you yes. find that difficult or challenging? Or I really fell back on readings for mine. So scholarly articles and blog posts um, are a great way to see just what somebody you know a mom or. Meredith sent me this incredible blog post last year that became such a center point of my project, and that wouldn't be a scholarly article, but that was really good first hand evidence for me. I don't think I ever really had conversations with people that I used, and I know that's a dilemma right now, because some of your projects might be very based on things that are going on in British Columbia and might be hard to find information about. I would talk to those people and see where you can maybe get tangible evidence of what they're saying, because there might be something written down, and so you can't quote, you can't cite quotes, can you? You can't direct quote someone else, no. you don't have proof. Yeah. But you can say, you know, in my conversations with teachers, yeah. I have come to understand that. Yeah. yeah. Right? In yeah. a roundabout way. Yeah. That's what I would do. <laughs> Just really, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Take what they're saying and be like, this is my conclusion of what they're yeah. saying, even though you can't quote it, if you need to do that. Try to find that tangible evidence of what they're saying. They probably wrote it down somewhere. And any other questions. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So our key takeaways are? Talk about it. Elevator speech. Right. Talk about it. Elevator speech. Writing. Right. Cut. Right. Cut. So we can get refined to our newfound understandings. UBC resources. And you got to talk. Passion. 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 Right. Really. Narrow it down. Why are you here? Why are you doing this?